Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have given us your confession of a true faith and to worship the true unity in the power of your divine, yes, also steadfast in this true faith and worship and defend us ever from all our adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God, now and forever. Today's first reading comes to us from the first chapter of Genesis and the first four verses of the second chapter of Genesis. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. So God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening. And there was morning, the third day. 
And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that all he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is great as no one can bow. I will meditate on your wonderful works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. Our second reading today comes to us from the second chapter of Acts. <laughs> then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. 
But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Alleluia. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 28th chapter, beginning at the 16th verse. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We speak our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the children to come forward. Have a seat, guys. Go ahead, sit down. Good morning. Okay. So, today's Trinity Sunday. Do you have any idea what the Trinity is? I could ask them that, too, and they might have trouble. Trinity is a word we use, triune, just like it. It means three in one. And that's how God has told us about himself, that he is three in one. That's why I've got this thing here. You see what this is? What is that? It's a triangle. There's three sides to that triangle, right? And they're all the same size, right? And sometimes we use a triangle to help us think about God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all equal. They're all part of the one God. Another symbol we use is a, a circle. You see that circle on there? A circle, a circle is without beginning, without end, because our God is forever. He did, he's always been around. And what's the main thing you see in this shape here? What's this main shape? A cross. What does the cross remind you of? Jesus. Jesus. And you know, that's how we know God best. We think about Jesus. That's how we know him best. But this is all put together here. It's kind of a puzzle. Just like the triune God is kind of a puzzle too. We've got the cross that tells us about Jesus. We've got the triangle that tells us that God is triune. And we've got the circle here. Which tells us that God is eternal without beginning, without end. We can't understand how that happens, but it does. God is, is without beginning, without end, and sometimes you know, it's all jumbled up and we can't really figure it out. We don't have to figure it out. We just have to believe it. God has told us he's Father, 
Sometimes we say the Father's the one who created us. God has told us he's Son, the one who died on the cross. And God has told us he's Holy Spirit. The Spirit's the one who brings us to faith. And he's the one who keeps telling us, every time we read the Bible, he keeps telling us more about himself. He helps us understand who our God is. Even if we can't understand the Trinity, the triune God, we want to believe what God has told us about himself. And that's what today is reminding us, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And I'll be talking about that some more in my sermon, but let's pray right now. Would you pray with me? Hold your hands. Dear Father, thank you for letting us know who you are. Thank you for loving us enough that you sent your Son to pay for our sins. Help us believe what you tell us about yourself, even if we can't always understand it. Help us believe that you love us so much that we can have the promise that we are forgiven for Jesus' sake. We hold on to that promise in faith, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up here today. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends. Our text is part of the first reading that was read today from Genesis chapter 1. Then, the, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Here ends our text. Image is everything. That's corporate America's mantra. Image is everything. They're consumed with their image. They have to be careful to portray themselves in a positive light. That's why they're so concerned about being politically correct, trying to avoid giving offense to anyone, at least those who will most likely patronize their business. They are so concerned about presenting the right image, so they're careful to make accommodations. Be careful what they say about COVID-19. 
or about race relations. Their image is so important. But individuals are very conscious about their image as well. People will take dozens of pictures of themselves just to find that right one to post on social media because they're so concerned about their image. Image is everything. They'll sort through all of them to find the one that makes them look most natural. Image. We are very image conscious in our world. Now you probably heard people say, we're all made in the image of God. That's Latin there for image of God. Image of God. And people will make that statement all the time. We're all made in the image of God. But I wonder how many times they really understand what that means. Oftentimes people will use that phrase to maintain we're all equal. We're all the same. We're all made in the image of God. And they'll say we're all made in the image of God to demand equal rights. Because after all we're all the same. All made in the image of God. But are we all equal? And the truth of the matter is in our world today we are not all equal. At least not in the eyes of of the world. All life is not considered the same. Children still in the womb are not counted as valuable by many. The life of a comatose woman with a feeding tube is not considered valuable even though we know that there are people who've been in comas for years and then have woken up. But those lives aren't considered as valuable when they're in that vegetative state. So is there really equality? Did you notice throughout this pandemic that some people were classified as essential workers and others as non-essential? Are we all equal in the eyes of the world? We hear reports of still today men and women doing the exact same job and getting different pay for doing the same work. Is there really equality? It's not all equal. Whether you're talking about white collar versus blue collar, renter versus homeowner, black versus white versus brown versus whatever, there's not equality. Do you attach a value to someone because of their ethnic origin or their skin color? Judgments and assumptions are made by every single ethnic group about every other ethnic group. In our dealings with other people, we make decisions daily. Is this person worth my time? My effort? My energy? My money? We make determinations that some are, which is trying to tell us that every life is valuable. The original intent of the slogan was not to deny that all lives matter, but rather that black lives are part of all lives so that they do matter. That's the point. All lives matter. Be like, I've, I've heard the analogy of the, the parable of the lost sheep. There were a hundred sheep under the care of that shepherd, but the one that mattered the most at that particular moment was the one that was lost that he went searching for. If someone's hurting, the whole body hurts, we're told in scripture. So we need to take that into account before we're quick to condemn those who are saying black lives matter. There is value. There is worth in every single life. At least that's what God tells us. Most of us have very vivid memories of 911. 9-11, even though it's been 19 years ago already that that happened. After 9-11, donations poured in to help the families of those who were killed. Compensation for the victims' families. When those donations poured in, they were passed on to the families, but do you know that not every family received the same amount? 
a determination was made about what each life was worth. So was a father worth more than a single man? Was an executive worth more than a cleaning woman? What about the potential of that individual for future earnings? What about those rescue workers who ran into harm's way and were perish, perished as a result? In the final analysis, some families receive 10 times more than other families. They all died, but some were considered more valuable than others. And I read that the task of determining what each family received fell to one man. After he completed the task, he said he would never do anything like that ever again in his life. How do you put a value on a life? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? It means that in the beginning, when God created everything, as we heard in our first reading today, man received something that all the rest of creation did not get. Everything was made good. In fact, God said after he finished creating, it was very good. But no other creature in heaven or on earth received what man received. No other creature could say it was made in the image of God. Not even the angels. That honor was given exclusively to mankind. Made in the image of God has nothing to do with what you look like. It means that you were created in righteousness. You were created holy. You were created with a knowledge of God. With true fear and confidence in God. With trust in him. That's the image of God that man was given at creation. Man was the crown of everything God made. Made in God's image. But on the day Adam and Eve sinned, the image of God was lost. It was gone. No longer did they fear and love God as they should. And that sin was passed on to us. No longer do they have a natural knowledge of God as a loving father. No longer do they have confidence in him. Rather, we try to take matters into our own hands. You see, sin broke us. Sin broke creation. It wasn't as God intended it to be. We are different from what God made, what he had hoped, what he intended. And that's why we look at others differently. That's why we get so upset when we see that phrase, Black Lives Matter. That's why we still get that knot in our stomach when we see a picture of those towers right before they fell. Not wanting to be seen as naked. Not wanting to be seen without the image of God. We try to create masks for ourselves. We try to hide behind an image that we make to show the world around us. We don't want people to think of us in certain ways. We've all created an image or a mask that we use so that people will think we're holier than we really are. What's yours? We're all made in the image of God. Even that is a, a mask that people try to hide behind so that if you make that claim, people can't condemn you if you've been made in God's image. But when all's said and done, we're all sinners. We're all broken. We've all, we've all fallen. We may be able, to be able to hide who we are from each other, but we can't hide it from God. He knows the effect that the fall had on us and the effect that our continued sin has on us. We've lost the image. But the God who created man in his image was not content to leave us as fallen, 
and broken. So he said, I'm going to restore the image. The God who created us is restoring his image in a fallen and broken world. Like I said, we, we try to create our own images for ourselves, but only God can create something out of nothing. He did it in the beginning, and he's able to still do it now. He's able to give us a restored image. After sin entered this world, after the image of God was lost, God acted. The Father sent his Son into this world, who is the true and exact image of himself. And the Son incarnate shows us that true man can be in the image of God as far as righteousness and holiness and confidence in God and trust in him is concerned. He showed us that true man was without sin the way God intended. Jesus, the image that we lost was in Christ. Because Jesus knows his Father. Jesus trusts and has confidence. Jesus was and is the righteous one. He came to restore that image of God in us. Not just by being the image, but by giving it to us. That's why he took your sin on himself. To pay its penalty. To take it away from you. And give you, not the punishment and death you deserve but to give you his spirit. To give you that spirit who would guide and direct you. Through the Holy Spirit, the image of God is again given to you. Not complete, not perfectly, but your image of God has been partly restored when you've been brought to faith in Christ. It's in the spirit of God that you have been recreated, that you have been made new again. And you're being conformed to that image of Christ in your day-to-day -day living. What we have to understand, and what we probably should understand as Christians, is that it's an ongoing process. You don't just get zapped and somehow now you're perfect. You know that. That's why we have confession and absolution every week. And should do it daily with, um, in our private devotions. Because it's a process. It's an ongoing thing. That's the work of the Trinity. In you and for you. The Father sent the Son who sends you his Holy Spirit. And the Spirit joins you to the Son who takes you to the Father. It's all working together to restore his image in you. And that's what we celebrate this day, Trinity Sunday. We celebrate how God has revealed himself to us, how each of them is working in our lives still today. Trinity and unity and unity and trinity. Today we proclaim what our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has done and is doing for each and every one of us. We proclaim that the Holy Trinity is still at work in the world today for the life of this world. God's trying to restore his image in you and in me and in all people. He gives it to you. Because if he didn't give you his image, you'd never have it. It's a gift he gives. With that understanding, when you think about those words that you heard in the gospel reading today, known as the Great Commission, they're not so much about what we are to do as about what God the Holy Spirit is doing. He works through God's people to go and make disciples. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are doing that work through the church in the world. Making disciples, baptizing, teaching, feeding, raising, forgiving, all through the means that he has given. The voices and the hands and the feet may be ours. But the work is God's, Father, Son, and Spirit, because it's his body, his blood, his water, his words. It's through those means that God is restoring, creating, giving, 
making something out of nothing, creating his children again in his image, conforming us to the image of the Son. We need to be image conscious. The attack in the garden caused devastation in this world. It's affected every single one of us. And the task of recovering what was lost that day fell to one man. And he did what was necessary to restore the image of God in us. He determined that each life was worth his own. So he gave his life. He suffered the shame and the nakedness of the cross. And then he rose in victory over death so that all who believe in him might be raised as well. We live with him not only in the future, but right now. We are his, in his image. And after Jesus completed this task, he said, no one ever has to do this again. It's finished. I did it. You are whole. You are healed. You are forgiven. You are recreated. And that's why we spoke earlier together in the service. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to him because he has shown mercy to us. Those words are what this day is about. God has shown us his mercy. And that's why we should sing his praises. We respond by giving glory to him. It's not something that we just do here and worship together. It's something we do every day of our lives. Show God how grateful we are. Give glory to him. Living in the image that has been restored in us. Living as Christ in the world. That will be evidenced when we give to the least of the brothers around us. It will be obvious when we try to look at everyone as being equal when we value each and every person we encounter as someone for whom Jesus died and therefore they have value and dignity we should be able to follow the example of Christ and strive towards saying each life is worth our own not because they are the image of God but because we are we should live knowing that we have the image of God. God help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. May the peace of God that passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in the true faith through life everlasting. Amen. rise for prayer. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We remember in our prayers today the family of Mel Sears. That's Jill Lund's uh, half-brother. He died suddenly yesterday. He was 55 years old. We pray for all those who are still uh, quarantined or sheltering at home because of they have compromised immune systems or other uh, factors that make them unable to be out in public. Bill and Lois Jennings ask that we offer prayers of thanks that Lois is having more good days these days. We continue to pray that uh, she will, that will continue until she's able to see the doctor for her blood pressure issues. Kidda Dory requests prayers for her husband that he can get Sundays off. And Jane Clouser asks prayers for her sister-in-law, Jane Peterson. She's had numerous seizures and is currently not able to walk. 
Let us pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, we do offer you our praises again this day for your creation, redemption, and sanctification. Father, as you are the author of creation, we give you thanks that you allow us to live in this beautiful world that you made. For the seasons, for the lofty skies, for day and night, we give you thanks. For evidence of your power revealed in towering mountain peaks, in ocean tides, even in the lightning of a storm and mighty rushing winds, we give you thanks for your inestimable and immeasurable love which provides for all of our needs and most of all for our redemption by sending your Son, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus Christ, you are indeed the author and perfecter of our faith for redeeming the world from the power of Satan, for freeing us from our slavery to sin, and for opening the gates of everlasting life, we ask that you would accept our sincere gratitude. For showing us how to live with each other, for suffering and dying in our place, and for giving lives purpose by commissioning us to be your witnesses, accept our gratitude. Lord, in your mercy. Spirit, source of faith, for having called us by the gospel and enlightened us with your gifts, for establishing the church on earth and for continuing to keep us in the true faith. We give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Father, Son, and Spirit, we are grateful that we can come to you with the confidence that you are listening for Jesus' sake. So we bring our petitions before you. We praise you for the good days that Lois has had and ask that you would continue to give her those good days. We pray that you would enable people to have the opportunity to worship you, whether it's a job that keeps them away or their need to shelter in place. Remind them that you are still with them. We pray for those with physical needs. We pray for Jane Peterson, that she could have healing from the effects of the seizures. We pray also, Lord, that you would grant comfort to those who grieve and mourn. We pray this day for Jill Lund and all of her family as they mourn the loss of her brother. Lord, in your mercy. All glory and honor and power and might be to you, O Lord, as we pray in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Into your hands we commend all for which we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, proper, and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with the church on earth and all the hosts of heaven, we praise your glorious name and join their unending hymn. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins, strengthen you, and keep you firm and steadfast in the true faith through life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
It is good to see all of you here with us today. Were there any announcement slides in there, Ma? Yes, next Sunday is Confirmation Sunday. Got delayed a little bit. It was supposed to have been the first Sunday of May, but we have eight young members of our congregation who will be making their profession of faith publicly next Sunday in our worship service. They'll be sharing the essays that they've prepared and then going through the rite of confirmation. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. A reminder to the members of the class, Saturday at 10 a.m., you need to be here as we go through everything and get you ready for that day. So I know we've been working on that for two years, but you need one, one more time to get, get ready for that day. A couple of other announcements. The Ladies of Grace, their evening Bible study on Friday evenings will be meeting this Friday. That's at Debbie's house, is that right? Yes, yes. okay, Debbie, Debbie Windorf's house. And you, how far into that study are you? Fourth or fifth week, somewhere in there. So you're welcome to join them. The study's on perseverance. And if you need directions, just call the church office. Debbie will tell you how to get there. Those are all the slides. I have a couple more announcements here. Uh, those of you who are, have been members of the praise team or would like to be a member of the praise team, we're going to meet briefly right after the service to talk about when we can have some rehearsals during the summer times to see if we can get some songs included in our worship services. Also, I've been asked to announce the memorial service for David Harvey. It's the, it was the brother-in-law of Larry Miller and Jan Grams. Uh, Judy uh, grew up, Judy Miller Harvey grew up in this congregation. David died, it was in March that he died? Yeah. His memorial service has been set for June 13th, this Saturday at 10.30 a.m. at the Our Savior Lutheran in McKinney. And one more announcement, uh, we did a traditional service today. We'll be doing that once a month throughout the summertime. Uh, we'll do it on the first Sunday of July as well. So we will be having the option of a traditional worship service for those of you who, who prefer that. Any other announcements today? April. One more thing, it's uh, com not coming up immediately, but we were supposed to have had a council meeting in May, our regular council meeting. That was postponed because of all the meeting restrictions. That council meeting will take place the last Sunday of this month, immediately after the worship service. So June 28th, we'll have that council meeting. There is an important, uh, very important piece of business on there. The council needs to go, go over the elders' recommendation for the intentional interim pastor. Uh, and the, the negotiations with him, and then they'll be calling a special voters meeting quickly after that to hopefully approve that selection of an intentional interim pastor. Uh, in case you haven't heard, my retirement, which was supposed to take place at the end of this month, has been postponed until the end of August, so you'll be looking for an intentional interim to be able to take care of your needs at the congregation here after that. God's blessings be with all of you. Can you extend that retirement for another year or two?